Great. Happy Passover. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, have to sell, I have to tell you this. I found my favorite new flavor of macaroon. I was at uh, the Jewish Jewel over uh, in West Rogers Park, and they have an assortment of macaroons. And I thought, eh, let's, let's go beyond the coconut and the almond. Let's try cookies and cream. And I thought, that was pretty good. But then I discovered pistachio orange. I'm telling you, I literally, I, I had an event where we had all of these macaroons, and I literally received text messages the next day. What was that one? Pistachio orange. So if you go and you buy macaroons, get pistachio orange. It's fantastic. Or if you're in my house, you don't have to put up with Manischewitz. You have my wife who made them from scratch last night. So let me pray. Avino Femolcano, our Father and our King, we praise you and we honor you. We, we thank you for the Lord's Passover. You show us your righteousness. You show us your judgment. You, so, you show us your grace all in one. Thank you for saving us from Egypt, and thank you for foreshadowing what you would do through your Son. And it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. This is an interesting Shabbat. It's an interesting Shabbat because if you're like me, you celebrated Passover last night. And uh, it's something that I look forward to, although I didn't always look forward to it, I'll, I'll be honest. When I was younger, I hated Passover because I didn't know what the heck we were doing, and nobody else seemed to care at all. And it wasn't until my father came to the Lord, and it wasn't until we started attending a congregation in Maryland that we actually appreciated what God did for us in Egypt and also what God did for us in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So I love Passover. I look forward to it. Frankly, I, it's usually my first day off in about four weeks. Um, I sit there with my children and uh, my wife and guests, and we celebrate, and for the first time, I don't have to teach what we're doing except to my children, which is such a blessing and a pleasure, and frankly, it's what the Lord told us to do in the book of Exodus. He told us, you shall teach your son. That's where we get the word Haggadah. So I teach my sons and my daughter. But contemplating the events 2,000 years ago between Yeshua's Passover, his crucifixion, and his resurrection are, are quite interesting. And so I'm going to ask this question uh, this morning. Why do we sometimes live as if he didn't live? Why do we sometimes live as if he didn't live? Now that question to you may be, may be so incredibly unique and, and really wow. Or it could be, yeah, yes, yeah, stupid, like that's why we're here. We believe Jesus rose from the dead after he was crucified. But frankly... So many people who claim to follow Yeshua today, in my opinion, in my discernment, in my judgment, live as if he hasn't resurrected. They live as if he's still in the grave or as, as if he's still on the cross. So my question is, why do we live as if he didn't? I think a lot of us almost live sort of like I have to imagine what the disciples experienced on Saturday. That's what day it is today, right? Put yourselves in the minds of the people who welcomed him in on Palm Sunday. They thought he was the king. They thought he was going to overthrow Rome. They thought that correct and proper worship would be established in Jerusalem. They thought that the prophecies of the prophets would actually come to fruition. And then just a few days later, the guy they put all their hope in wrongfully accused, led astray by his own people, by his own disciples, at least one of them, he was put to death. He was murdered. Gruesome. His mother sat there and watched. The disciples that had been with him for three years watched and they had to be thinking, what in the world is happening? We've seen this guy heal the sick allow the lame to walk, give sight to the blind, teach in, in ways that we've never understood before. How is this happening? We put all of our hope into him. We thought he was going to bring us our kingdom. We thought that God would reign through him. We thought that he would sit on the throne like King David. And yet, yesterday we had to put him into a tomb. 
try to, try to feel what they felt, what the men and women who followed him along felt, what James and, and Peter and John and all of his disciples felt, what Mary felt. I imagine their heads were completely down. I imagine it was one of those things when you wake up in the morning, but you're reminded of that horrible, horrible feeling that you went to sleep with the night before, and you wish that your eyes didn't open again. You wish, can I please go back to sleep? Because for the seconds that I'm asleep, I don't have to think about this horror. All my hope was dashed. Everything that I put my hope in is now gone. Now you may say, well, didn't they believe in the resurrection? I would say, yeah, they believed in a resurrection, but did they understand that Yeshua himself would resurrect from the dead? I don't really think so. I don't think so. And so as that, as that Saturday morning, as Shabbat actually started to rise, they couldn't even busy themselves, right? Because it's Shabbat. You're not allowed to do anything. They couldn't even busy themselves to distract themselves. Instead, they had to sit with it. The fact that their rabbi, the, the guy they thought was the Messiah, was dead. And then Sunday morning came. And I give credit to Mary and Mary because they wanted to see to the body of Yeshua. I'm, prob- I'm guessing that the, the, the male disciples probably just stood there. In this situation, I kind of think like Mary and Mary remind me of my wife because she wanted to get stuff done, you know? They wanted to get stuff done. And so they were going to go tend to the body. They were going to go check on the grave. They were going to, I have no idea, pray to God, but they had to be wondering, what now? What now? I don't know what's left. Is God a lie? Was he just not the Messiah? What now? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. And I want you to see the reaction that they have. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse, let's start in verse 5. So the angel is speaking to them. In verse 5 it says, The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Yeshua, who has been crucified. He's not here. For he has risen. Now, if that was me, I would have maybe doubted a little bit, but perhaps the the shininess of the angels gave them reason to believe. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Now, at that moment, if you were to go through the Gospels, you might recall Yeshua told them. He alluded to the fact that he would die and alluded to the fact that he would rise. I'm sure it didn't really make sense to the disciples at the time, but all of those emotions, all of those feelings, all of the memories of what he taught probably began flooding back to Mary and Mary. Go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into the Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly. I like that adverb, quickly. They left fast. This wasn't a slow jog, right? Imagine if you had just all, you know, Saturday you were in mourning. Saturday you were crying your eyes out. Saturday, what in the world is next? And all of a sudden, you are told that the rabbi that you had dedicated the past three plus, life, three, three plus years of your life was now alive again, doing the impossible because, you know, Death, right? That doesn't, that doesn't get overcome. They were probably running in the ugliest, fastest way possible. They ran quickly. With fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. It's that moment when you, you get so happy you can't wait to tell the people that you love something so exciting. Verse 9, and behold, (laughs) Yeshua met them and greeted them. I don't know if you're looking in your scripture. What does your Bible say when it says he greeted them? 
What is it? Good morning. <laughs> I mean, this is a weird thing. It's translated so differently, but in, in one translation I read, it goes, greetings. Like, it's a matter of fact, hey ladies, how are you? <laughs> when they saw him, what, I mean, can you imagine what they would have felt? Every, every emotion, everything that you had put your hope in all of a sudden was there in front of you after one of the most gruesome scenes that you had ever seen, a guy nailed to a cross, and he goes, hey, good morning. It's almost as if the nightmare was over. Were we living this? I mean, were we dreaming? And, and behold, Yeshua met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. What if we lived like that? What if we lived with such great excitement because we knew that Yeshua had conquered sin and death itself? What if we ran in an ugly way because we were so excited to tell everybody something that proved that the supernatural is real, that God indeed raised this man from the dead, which we all know is completely impossible? What if we lived like he lived? What if we lived in the reality knowing that he rose from the, from the dead? Now maybe that thought isn't a big one for you. I tell you what, it is for me. And frankly, it is for a lot of people who profess Yeshua in this world. So we're going to look at 1 Peter, and we're going to understand a little bit about what Peter thought about this. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. What does it look like? What does it mean? How do we live if he actually rose from the dead? Could it actually impact our lives now? You know, we can talk about a lot of different things, right? We can talk about the fact that the resurrection happened on the Feast of First Roots, Habikurim, right? We can, we can talk about the idea that the resurrection of the dead has some eerie similarities to the idea of Noah and his family coming out of the flood and the Jewish people coming out of Egypt through the Red Sea and even the Jewish people going into the Promised Land through the Jordan River. <clears throat> All of those things have eerie similarities to this concept of, of being resurrected from the dead. Because frankly, we are dead in our sins, and we are made alive in Messiah, and God likes to bring people to life, spiritually. But we're going to talk about what it means for us today. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. I like that term. It says, uh, it says, actually, this is where we get the idea of born again, not John chapter 3. We get it from here, because there it says born from above. Here it says born again, although it alludes to it in John 3. He says, he caused you to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah from the dead, in order to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You know, the writers of the Bible often like to string sentences that would always get marked out in red in an English class. But let's break that down a little bit. He caused us to be born again. He caused us to be born again to a living hope. Why? Because he lived. And if he's not dead, then we have hope. Because he, we have hope in the miraculous. We, they saw him do miracles. We read about his miracles. He rose from the dead. If that's not miraculous, I don't know what is. So we are born again with a new lease on life. To a living hope not a dead hope, a living hope, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, which will be revealed at the end. We may not have been physically born, be, uh, born a second time, but because of the resurrection of our Messiah, we actually are born again spiritually. And the prize that we could have been pursuing the reward in our lives that we could have been pursuing, it doesn't really matter anymore because what he had, he's given us birth again to do is 
to gain something that is not perishable, that is not defiled, that does not fade away. The reality is, because he rose from the dead, he has written our ending, the ending to our story. How does that relate to me? For me, I came to faith at the age of 10. I watched one of those cheesy uh, Christian cartoon videos, you know, uh, which I've now shown my kids, and actually I think they're fantastic, but that's what happened to me. But then I was a teenager. Do I have any teenagers? Woo! Right up here. All right. Anybody have a teenager? Good. Anybody been a teenager? Good. Anybody's husband act like a teenager? Good. Did my wife put up her hand? I think I was a typical teenager. I was moody, and I didn't want what God wanted. For me, God seemed like he was a bunch of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that, and basically don't have fun. And so I started pursuing what the world said was fun. I started pursuing what I saw on TV. I started pursuing what I saw in, in, in movies and music. And you know what? There was some fun in it for very short amounts of time. The enjoyment was very, very fleeting because I developed this habit, and the habit was this, and maybe you can relate. I looked for approval. I looked for approval not from God, not from his word. I looked for approval from my friends, from people who didn't know me. Anybody who didn't love me already, that's who I wanted approval from. And it, it, the problem with that is I found myself in an emotional prison every single evening, every single night, because I thought and thought and overthought every single interaction I had on, in that day. And in that time period, we were all online in, in chat rooms and on instant messenger. So I would have conversations with people online, with apparent people that were my friends, but I would overthink everything. Did I say something stupid? Did I say something that they could judge me for? Did they like me? Did, they have, did I have their approval? Was I valuable in their eyes? Did they think I was funny? Did they think I was smart? But my hope was only in that. Because if I didn't have a sense of approval as I went to sleep that night, I was a wreck. And this probably went on for about three years where it was this daily cycle and that becomes incredibly exhausting. Looking for people's approval, acting for their approval, performing for their appraisal, for their approval, for their value, for, because that's the only place I got my value. And if you've ever done that, if you've ever acted for other people's approval, and that's the only sense of worth that you had outside of the Lord, you know it's exhausting, and you know it's fleeting. My goals were completely corruptible. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't, it's firm. They weren't, they weren't what God could give me. They just didn't last. Unlike where it says in 1 Peter, undefiled reward, my rewards were the approval of people that were flawed themselves. I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. And so, after about three years of this, my grades started sinking. I, for the first time, I got a C. That's bad. That's bad. And then I found myself, I thought my friends had left me, and when you, when you value what your friends think, I found myself at 2 a.m. in a townhouse development, screaming profanities at the top of my lungs, and the lights start coming on, and then the police sirens you start to hear, and then my friends finally come back because I'm standing in the middle of this townhouse development just, just out of my mind practically. And then the cops all get us, they handcuff us, they sit us on the curb, they accuse us of stuff, they pat us down. I didn't care or know or understand what it meant to have hope in a really great inheritance in Yeshua. For me, I didn't care that he resurrected from the dead. It didn't matter because I only cared what other people who I saw thought about me. This is what Peter is encouraging these people to do. Have hope outside of yourself. Have hope outside of the people around you. Have hope outside of things that you normally get value from. 
Maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's cars. Maybe it's the look of your house. Maybe it's your Instagram. Maybe, and I know a lot of you are on Instagram, right? I'm not. <laughs> maybe it's respect. Maybe it's your education. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's whatever. All of those things are corruptible and defilable. But he gives us the end of our story, which is not defilable, which is not corruptible. And the reason we should have hope is because he rose from the dead. If he conquered something that we thought was unconquerable, then we have hope in things that we thought were initially impossible. What does it mean to live as if he had resurrected from the dead? Look at verse 6 with me. Because of the resurrection, he says this in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice. Even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Now, I don't want to make anybody going through things th think that, you know, what they're going through isn't significant. That's not what I'm saying. But, according to Peter, the difficulty that we face in this world, even when they are horrible, pale in comparison with the glory that has been given to us, through the resurrection of a man who was once clinically dead. Because he rose from the grave, we can have joy because we know what the end of the story is. Even when we go through trials. And what Peter is saying to this Jewish audience that is scattered across the Mediterranean is, you're going to have trials. You know, oftentimes we're told when you come to faith in Yeshua, when you believe in Jesus, you're not going to have any more problems. Anybody have problems in here? Okay. In fact, the scripture tells us the exact opposite. You're going to have problems. So if anybody tries to share the good news of Yeshua with you and says, don't worry, your problems will go away, they're selling you beachfront property in Arizona. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't actually happen. He says, so, have, so in this you greatly rejoice. Verse 7, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. That means when the end does come, your faith will be the proof to everybody else. Your conduct, your walk, because of the resurrection of Yeshua, because you have a living hope, because you know the end of the story, will speak volumes to the people who are around you. Verse 8, and, and though you have not seen him, and these are the people, they didn't experience the resurrection, they, but they know it. That's us. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him but greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Joy inexpressible. That's what I think Mary and Mary experienced. That's when they ran like crazy to tell the disciples, he's not dead, he's not dead, he's not dead, he's back. Our hope is renewed, our hope is restored, and if he conquered death, then anything in God's arsenal is possible. Joy inexpressible. I can't even describe with words. I'm trying to. I'm up here. I'm going to start flubbing all over my, my words. I can't describe what they felt. But we act as if it didn't happen. We act as if he died but stayed in the ground. What does it mean for you if you died with him and didn't rise with him? That's how a lot of us live our lives. That's why a lot of people walk away from the Messiah, walk away from a church, and walk away from a congregation. It's not because Yeshua himself is not so great. He is great. It's because so many times the people that profess to follow him aren't so great. They give him a bad name. We give him a bad name. The victory is already well in hand. And Mary sort of felt that, that instant when she realized that he was alive and then met him and then fell down and worshipped at his feet in fear, but in joy. Why did I find myself screaming profanities at the top of my lungs? I shouldn't have found myself doing that. I came to faith 
watching a video about how Paul shared the gospel. Now you may think, yeah, Paul shared the gospel everywhere, but remember who Paul was. Paul was a guy who was involved with the murder of Jewish people who put their faith in the Messiah. He had a radical transformation. He met Yeshua while riding to a city to persecute more of his people. And then he went throughout the Mediterranean world to share the very same message. I'm sure people had mixed reactions to his, his coming. But the reason I came to faith was because of what this passage just said. The faith that he had, in spite of the fact that people were going to reject him, was absolutely incredible. You see, when I was watching those cartoon videos, it was this video called The Ministries of Paul. I didn't know who Paul was at the age of eight, but I found out through this video. He went from town to town, boats, walking, probably some horses, maybe a chariot or two. And was he welcomed when he went into these towns? Sometimes, maybe initially he was welcomed because he went to the synagogue first and he spoke with his people, but eventually in almost every city he visited, what happened? He was kicked out. At the very least, he was kicked out. But often, they hurled insults at him. Often, they spit at him. Often, they threw stones at him. And one time, they stoned him to death, or so they thought. They stoned him, and they left him for dead. And as an eight-year-old, I thought to myself, why in the world would you keep doing this job? If, if you have to hide, if you have to hide in people's houses, if you have stones thrown at you, if your own people insult you constantly, if you have to be lowered over a wall to save your life, if people leave you lying in the street like you're dead, wouldn't you stop? Wouldn't you think, ah, I guess I'm not very good at this. <laughs> wouldn't you think it's not worth it? Wouldn't you ask God, why in the world is this happening to me? Don't you want me to do this? I mean, you sent me to be an apostle, right? You told me I'm supposed to be sent. That's what apostle means. Why is this happening? But as an eight-year-old, I was moved to tears watching this video because I thought, oh my goodness, this guy has such great faith in the resurrected Messiah that he's willing to endure whatever it takes to share the message, the only message that can save our souls. And because of his great faith, even through trial, I ran up to my parents, crying as an eight-year-old, and I said, I don't understand what I'm feeling right now. Why would this man keep doing this unless the message was worth it and he loved other people? Isn't that what it says in 1 Peter? Even through trials, because you have such great hope, because you know the story at the end, because you know that you are going to be victorious, your faith will get you through. Your faith will actually be glorious when he returns because it will be a testimony. Why? Because he met the resurrected Lord. Paul met the resurrected Lord. Peter met the resurrected Lord. That's why with such boldness he can say these things. And according to Christian tradition, do you know how Paul died? It wasn't good. But he did it with boldness because he knew the Lord resurrected. And after that, man, remember he, remember Peter? He actually denied Yeshua three times. Three times. Yeshua told him he would and he still did it because he was afraid for his life. Hanging around to see what would happen with Yeshua in custody, he denied Yeshua three times. But after he resurrected, as he was sitting on a beach in the Galilee, he affirmed Yeshua three times. Why? Because he saw the resurrected Lord and he couldn't deny it. Anything was possible, and he was going to submit his entire life to dedicate to this resurrected Messiah who he knew would be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He was joyful as he shared these words, and so was Paul. Just look at every greeting that he gives in all the books that he wrote. That he wrote. Look at verse 13. <clears throat> Now this is, I actually am preaching from a different Bible because the Bible that I'm norm I normally use, I didn't like the translation of this. I want to know how your Bible says it. What are the first few words? Does anybody have like a, an NIV? 
NIV? No. Okay, New King James? Oh, NIV, all right. What does it say in the NIV in verse 13? Prepare your minds for action. I like that. That's what mine says. Does anybody say something different? What does yours say? With your minds ready for action. Okay, I like that one. My version that I normally read had a very pitiful understanding of this. So I did look it up in the Greek. And yeah, this is like a proactive cognitive battle that you're preparing for. So it says in verse 13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. That's sort of a, a funny thing to say unless you're someone like me who had a very overactive thought life who second-guessed everything they did. What happens is that Peter says, because of the resurrection of the Messiah, because of the joy that you have, because you've been born again to a living hope, because you know the ending of the story, prepare your minds for battle. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. When it says revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, that means at the coming of, the, of Yeshua uh, the Messiah. He says, so as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which, you were, which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written... You shall be holy, for I am holy. Prepare your minds for battle. Prepare your minds for action. What does that tell you? That tells you there's going to be a battle. There's going to be warfare. Something is going to happen in your mind that is going to fight against the reality that you are different, that you are born again, that you can have joy, that will deny the fact that he resurrected from the dead. So what would happen, what would happen if you decided to mentally and cognitively, in prayer, filter everything that you do, all your interactions, through the fact that Yeshua conquered sin and death by rising from the dead? What would happen? I know we kind of take this for granted, right? Chances are, if you're here, you probably have put your faith that Yeshua died for your sins and rose from the grave. You probably know that, but sometimes when we sit here, we take these things for granted, and we don't think about what they actually mean. What would it look like if you filtered every thought, every action, every interaction through the fact that Yeshua rose from the grave? I don't know about you, but maybe it would make everything else going in my life pale in comparison. Again, it doesn't mean that the problems that you have in your life aren't significant. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to help you through them. It doesn't mean that you can't talk to him about them. But what it does mean is that if you put into perspective the fact that the Lord himself raised the Messiah from the dead, anything is possible, including your joy in difficult situations. How would it change your manner of living if you had confident hope because he rose from the dead? Unfortunately, the tendency is to go back to our old ways, our old ways of dealing with things, our old ways of dealing with difficulty, our old ways of dealing with disappointment. And what happened in the old ways? We tried to get our own hope. We tried to manufacture our own joy, right? That's what I was trying to do. I tried to garner everybody's approval of me so that I could feel okay. Not happy, just above water. It said, don't conform to the former lusts or the former selfishness or the former self-interests. Why? Because now that Yeshua rose from the dead, his interest should be in the forefront of our minds. But we often try to take back our sin, our selfish desires that we nailed him to the cross with. Maybe because it's familiar Maybe because it's comfortable, and maybe because trusting in Yeshua is sometimes hard. It's almost as if we're saying, no, Yeshua, that's okay. You don't need to die for me, let alone conquer my selfishness and my sin. I'll handle it on my own. I'll give in to my self-centered ways. I'll just do what comes naturally in the moment, and then I'll fight for myself. Because, you know, that worked so well before. And we completely forget that he already fought for us. He already paid the price. And then 
He gave us authority over those old ways by rising from the dead. In Romans chapter 6, it says, why do we act as if sin still has mastery over us? Why do we act as if we're still prey to sin? We are more than conquerors through the Messiah who rose from the dead. So how do you get out of that line of thinking, right? How did I get out of that line of thinking that I needed everybody's approval just for my sense of worth? Well, after the cops were called, <laughs> after my friends who were supposed to like me stopped liking me because I got them in trouble, and they were, they were just like, what's going on with you? I went to my parents, and I asked them to help me because for three years I'd been living this way, and I, it, it was mental hell. I was in my own head the entire time, and so they introduced me to a friend of theirs who discipled young men. And for the first time, I was able to say the things out loud that I was thinking inside. And once I started saying them out loud, I started realizing what I actually thought and how I actually ran my life. I ran my life as if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. I ran my life like he had forgiven me of my sins, but he was still in the ground. I ran my life as if he was merely a tool to get me to heaven, but I still had to do everything else on my own. My brothers and sisters, I submit to you, that's how a lot of us function. He's just a ticket to get to heaven. We believe in him. We believe he paid the price. Maybe we believe he rose from the dead. But other than that, we don't love him. We don't ask him for help. We don't ask him for assistance. And by the way, if he hadn't risen from the dead, you couldn't do any of those things. But since he did rise from the dead, he wants to be involved in our lives. He showed us that it's possible to defeat the things that try to separate us from God's holiness. And so for the first time, I started reading this book. And for the first time, I started applying it to my life. And for the first time, I started realizing, wait a second, instead of having to fight for value and fight for worth, I had been given all the value, all the worth, and all the holiness that I could ever need. It was completely undefilable. It was completely incorruptible. And yet I was fighting for something that was so counterfeit and so fleeting, that was pointless. And it took mental exercise. It took constant prayer. It took saying to myself, be, how does it say it in verse 13? Therefore, prepare your minds for action. I didn't prepare my mind for action on my own. I prepared my mind for action with the help of the Lord. Lord, I am believing this lie right now because, is, because it is the old way I used to do things. But you say something completely different about the reality that I exist in and about who I am. So Lord, please help me walk in that reality. Because if you rose from the dead, I can do anything through the Messiah who strengthens me. I began filtering my life through the fact that he resurrected and that he was powerful and that he had given me that power. So what? Skip down to verse 17. This will be our last section. It says this, if you, address the fa if you address Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay. This is one of the other reasons I chose this version. My other version didn't say it very well. Peter does this little thing, just with a few words. He goes, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay. This is not while you're at a hotel, right? This is not while you're at the Airbnb. What do you think he's saying? He's saying during the time of your stay here on earth. It's fleeting. It's quick. It doesn't mean it's not important, but he says, conduct yourselves in fear, in fear of the Lord, during the time of your stay on earth. What does that tell you? That tells you that instead of a temporal perspective, instead of a short-term perspective, instead of a perspective that says, I need to get as much as for me and me and mine, right now, as much as I can get, there's actually eternity that you have waiting for you. Remember, it says that you will receive an incredible reward when, the Lord, when Yeshua reveals himself at the end of eternity. You will live with him in eternity. So this present life that we're living, it's nothing in comparison 
to living with the Messiah because you have an incredible, undefilable, incorruptible reward waiting for you. So fear the Lord while you're here for this short time. Knowing that you were redeemed, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of, of life inherited from your forefathers. Yeah, there are things that are garbage in our lives. That we inherited bad habits and bad traits from the people who went before us. Maybe we were born in a, in a situation that was less than optimal. Maybe something happened to us. Maybe we made bad choices. Yeah, that all exists. I understand that. But you were redeemed from that. Verse 19, But with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Messiah, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Again, there's that eternity thing. Before the world that you know existed, he was. And he redeemed you with his own blood. But he has appeared in the last times for the sake of you. <laughs> for you. You're not some person that has to fight for everything that you have on your own. It doesn't matter. He's fighting for you. Verse 21. For the sake of you who through him are believers of God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Those are the two bookends. He made us born again to have a living hope. And he ends it with, again, the reason he was rected, uh, resurrected is so that you have faith and hope. That's the reality. So the question is, why do we live as if he hasn't resurrected? Why do we live sometimes as if we're the sources of our own hope? Why do we try to believe in ourselves more than we believe in a God who did the impossible by raising someone whose breath had stopped, whose heart had stopped, and whose blood had stopped flowing? I don't know if there's any doctors here, but if someone's dead three days, you don't usually, you're not usually able to bring someone back to life. But if you are, chances are that person is the Messiah. If he didn't rise, then your hope in God would be less or non-existent. Yeshua would be like the sheep and the goats who died for our sins, but didn't rise from the dead. If he didn't rise, you would have no authority over your sin, no sign that it was conquerable with God's help. If he didn't rise, what would the end of the age bring? We don't know. If he didn't rise, who's in control of this world? Who's in control of my life? If he didn't rise, how should I deal with the difficult things in my life? If he didn't rise, what hope do I have of truly living an abundant life? I don't. He would be no better than the bulls or the goats. If I had no eternal perspective that an incredible reward was waiting for me and everybody who put their faith in Yeshua the Messiah, then I only have a right now perspective. And that's how I lived. Everything for right now. What happens when you have a right now perspective? They make you do crazy things. They make you say things to the people you love that you should never say. They make you hurt the people in your life that you don't want to hurt. They make you drive by your girlfriend's house just because you didn't get a good reaction in your previous interaction. They, they make you scream profanities at the top of your lungs in a townhouse development at 2 a.m. They make you call somebody way too often when you don't get a quick response back. They make you worry about what everybody else thinks of you. It makes you do all those things when you don't have God's eternal perspective. Because I put my faith in him, my sinful self was put to death with him. But because he rose from the dead, I rose from the dead too, born again to a living hope. Because he rose, I have hope and faith that he is and he will be victorious. Because he rose, I have been born again with a new perspective. Because he rose, my glorious ending will be like his with him. Because he rose, I can have inexpressible joy like the Marys, even in difficult times because he won and so will I. It, because he rose, I don't have to fight for myself through my selfish desires. Because he rose, I filter my life through his power over death. Because he rose, I have an eternal Yeshua as king, 
centered perspective instead of worrying about me right now? What would it mean if you lived your life as if he rose from the dead? Because my brothers and sisters, it is a cold hard fact and a reality that he did. And it's because he did that you can be victorious in your life with him. Let's pray. Father, help us not to live Saturday after the crucifixion lives, worrying about what happens next, worrying that we don't really have direction, not knowing if God is really for us or against us. Help us to live the Sunday life where nothing else matters except for the fact that he conquered death itself, which you told us he would do way back in the Hebrew Scriptures. Help us to walk in that victorious living. Because he rose from the dead, everything is conquerable. Because he rose from the dead, we have authority with you. Thank you, Lord, for raising him from the dead so that we might have life to the fullest. In your son's holy name, amen.